I want you to take a moment to look at the world around you. Really, look. We inhabit this planet, interacting with our environment every day, but rarely stop to consider the stuff around us. What is it made of? How did it get here? Or where will it go when we're done using it? From the chair you're sitting in, to the shirt I'm wearing, even the breakfast that we all really should have made time for this morning, we're constantly interacting with matter that actually comes from biology, stuff that is alive or was alive. It's called biomaterial. And the term might sound like something out of science fiction, but the reality is most of humanity's greatest technological achievements have been made of this stuff. We've been using it, well, since before recorded history, all the way to today. Let me show some examples. Clothing, from ancient to modern. Shelters, traditional or today's homes. Uh, the ships, which first enabled us to explore our planet. Even the first airplanes. And food. Bread, beer, cheese. We've even engineered foods like corn for millennia, shaping its evolution from barely edible to today's modern ag agricultural staple. And more recently, we've started directly editing its genes to make engineered versions called GMOs. Now, we've all heard of genetically modified organisms, but there's a stigma. We think of massive monocultures of crops which can lead to pesticide overuse or monopolies involved in patent disputes, but this is only the tip of the iceberg for genetic engineering. And it's old technology, 20 years old. These GMOs only have one gene added. But today, we have the ability to add multiple genes, genetic networks that interact with each other, carry out logic, build complex biomolecules. We can even rewrite an organism's entire genome, replacing every bit of DNA, and then boot up the cell with this synthetically created code. This technology is called synthetic biology. And synthetic biology will allow a new era of biomaterials. We're already on the verge. Instead of being limited to the biomaterials we can find in nature, for the first time, we're gaining the ability to program our own materials. Materials that can help solve some of Earth's biggest challenges. Pollution, access to clean water. It may even be possible to fight back against climate change. But how can we do this with material? Well, go back to those questions that we asked about the stuff around us. How did these things get here? They grew. This is quite possibly the most important feature of biology, its ability to self-organize. Through interactions at the molecular scale, living things grow. They assemble themselves, adapt to their environment, and repair themselves. It's almost magical. Living things are self-assembling factories. Factories that have been programmed by nature to make complex structures like feathers or wood, even antibiotics. But what are they made of? Carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen. These are the main components of biomaterial, and they are literally everywhere. The most abundant elements on our planet. Cells assemble these atoms into an infinite number of shapes, and depending on their conformation, they can be used for anything from energy, like this tiny glucose molecule, to information storage, like this strand of DNA, even functional proteins, like this neurotoxin, which is what discourages bugs from eating genetically modified corn. You probably know this neurotoxin by its commercial name, Botox. And Instead of, like many of today's technologies that use mining to obtain rare earth elements, biology uses the elements it has on hand. Cells can even pull carbon directly out of the air and remove heavy metals from the soil. And instead of releasing harmful pollutants into the atmosphere, some cells just release oxygen. Life, it follows a cadence. Things are born. They grow, they die, and they decompose. Impermanence is the very nature of nature. So where will this stuff go when we're done using it? 
Well, instead of lingering in the environment for centuries like plastics, biomaterial generally breaks apart if it gets too hot or too wet, even too salty. And this is a good thing because when you think about it, so much of the stuff around us lasts for much, much longer than it really needs to. Styrofoam, for example. It's used mainly as packaging material or in to-go containers, but these are both things that are only used for a very short period of time, and then they're thrown away, sent to a landfill or the ocean to sit. Tires are another example. They have to be replaced, but once they're removed, tires don't just go away. Discarded tires can release toxic chemicals into the environment, and what's worse is sometimes people try to burn them to get rid of them, which just releases those same chemicals into the air. We can eliminate this kind of waste by replacing these products with specially engineered biomaterials made from GMOs. The combination of the ability to be decomposed, self-assembly, and the use of cheap, bio, cheap uh, raw materials is what makes biomaterials perfect for sustainable products. I think this stuff is really cool. I've been a biology nerd for as long as I can remember, even learned how to handle cells and edit DNA right here at this university. But I wanted to do more. So this summer, I started hacking biology in my free time. And you can too. I joined a community lab called Counterculture Labs. Community labs are a relatively new concept. They're places where anyone can go and work on biology research. Even if you don't know anything about lab safety, community labs offer classes to help you learn. Counterculture Labs has a number of ongoing projects, but there's two that really stand out. The first is to engineer a strain of yeast that produces milk proteins that would then be used to make cheese. Now, it might seem weird or gross, but since no animals are involved at any step of the process, the end result is cruelty-free, hormone-free, vegan cheese. Now, I've had a few vegan cheese substitutes before, and they're not cheese. But this, this isn't just a cheese substitute. This would be real vegan cheese. And cruelty-free is great, but if we could eliminate animals from cheese making, we would significantly decrease the carbon footprint of your Parmigiano-Reggiano. The other project I think is even more inspiring. It's called Open Insulin, and it aims to use similar gene editing techniques to reprogram E. coli, not to make milk, but to make insulin for diabetics. And if you think it's weird to use programmed E. coli to make medicine, think again. We've already been doing it. All medical insulin since the 1980s has come from some kind of genetically modified organism. And E. coli isn't just limited to insulin either. There's a number of pharmaceuticals on the market today made by genetically modified organisms, tiny drug factories. But they all have one thing in common. Their genes are locked down with patents. Open insulin is different. The, gl the group plans on open sourcing the entire project and will be publicizing the final DNA sequence. You've heard of open source software. Well, this is open source biology, open source medicine. If you're wondering how this is possible, take a look at this chart from the NIH. The cost of sequencing DNA is decreasing at an astonishing pace. It, sequencing is a fundamental part of the process of engineering life. For those of you not familiar with Moore's Law, this is the phenomenon in computers that basically explains why a two gigabyte micro SD card cost $100 when it was first introduced in 2006, only $12 in 2009, and you can find them today for less than a dollar. This is the trend that has led us to our democratization of tech that we have today. It's why we all have insanely powerful networked computers in our pockets right now. If you notice, the cost of sequencing DNA is decreasing much faster than even Moore's Law predicts. This is a big deal. It's why community labs like Counterculture Labs can execute projects like Open Insulin with only a few thousand dollars in donated or even homemade lab equipment. And if the trend holds true for synthetic biology, like it has for computers, we may come to rely on genetically modified organisms, much like we've come to rely on our smartphones. One of the most high-profile projects in synthetic biology is called Glowing Plant. And the project set out to make just that, 
a plant that would glow in the dark. They wanted to come up with something to replace streetlights that was not only more sustainable, but made less light pollution. The project launched on Kickstarter with only crowdsourced funding. And now they're part of a startup accelerator, a lot like a software company. These are exciting times for synthetic biology, much like for the first personal computers were exciting for computer scientists. But you don't have to be a scientist either. Even designers are starting to get involved. Susan Lee is a fashion designer, and she's been making clothes out of bacteria. She started by growing these bacterial colonies in her bathtub. That's right, she grew bacteria in her bathtub on purpose. <laughs> Once they're large enough, she uses these cells as a kind of fabric to make clothes, and not just for the shock value. Clothes like this, made of bacteria, are compostable. So when they go out of style, they won't end up in a landfill, they'll end up in a garden. Some projects are even more artistic, like this one from Genspace, which is another community lab in New York. Participants in this project have painstakingly gathered bacterial samples from across the city and cataloged them based off of where they came from. The cells were allowed to grow and then printed block by block in a pattern mimicking the city's street grid. The end result is this picture of New York painted not with acrylic or oil, but with living cells. Bacteria, where every square is made of the bacteria that inhabit that corresponding part of the city. Biological design. It's always been a part of human history. And the day will come when we'll be able to grow our own clothing or our own medicine, maybe even our own homes. But before we get there, we need a clearer public understanding of exactly what a GMO is. The understanding that not every GMO is meant to be eaten, not every GMO is meant to be patented. Not every GMO is inherently dangerous. Look around you again and imagine a world where your chair grew itself, eliminating the need for logging, transportation, construction costs. A world where my shirt could glow in the dark. I could go for a run or a bike ride at night without having to worry if drivers could see me. A world where the milk where we had with breakfast this morning was made without animals and had a lower carbon footprint. These things are all possible, but in order to get there, we have to understand that we don't need to fear GMOs, that they can actually be a good thing for the planet and for us.